following preview was begrudgingly approved for all audiences. You're listening to Elevator Music. Welcome back to Forward Thinking, presented by the Professional Collegiate League. I'm Ricky Vellante, and I'll be joined by my co-host, David West, shortly. As usual, we'll be talking to guests challenging the status quo, doing social good, and bringing about positive change to the world, while also talking a little bit of sports. In this episode, we're joined by two guests. To start, we're going to speak with Clarence Bucky McGill, member of the famed Syracuse 8, and then we'll be joined by Washington Post columnist and regular on ESPN's Around the Horn, Kevin Blackstone. As you may have noticed, we took the last couple of months off. As much as we love doing this show, between what we're doing for the PCL, the guidance we're providing to members of Congress as it relates to federal name, image, and likeness and athletic reputation legislation, as well as the general athlete advocate work that we're doing, especially during this time of the pandemic. Our schedule simply didn't allow to do episodes during that time. But we're back now and we will be each week. What I find particularly interesting about this episode is that when we spoke to Bucky, it was at the beginning of the Pac-12 and Big Ten threatened boycotts and player demands that were made to the conference offices and the universities. Taking a look at how things felt in the moment, then we're going to jump ahead and look at how things have played out over the last several weeks with Kevin Blackstone, especially now that the Pac-12 and Big Ten have both voted to return to play in October and November. For those of you that are David's age or my age or younger, I'll give you a warning that some of the things you're going to hear in this episode, especially about the treatment of black athletes in the 60s and 70s and earlier, is going to be a little shocking. For those of you that choose to watch this rather than uh, listen to it on your favorite podcast platform, you're definitely going to see some facial reactions from David and I, especially when we hear from Bucky about how he and his black teammates were treated before, during, and after the Syracuse 8 boycott. And then again, when we talk with Kevin Blackstone about the treatment, historically speaking, of Black athletes and the attempts to protest during sport. You can get more information about the Professional Collegiate League and Forward Thinking at thepcleague.com slash forward thinking. And be sure to like and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and on the PCL YouTube channel. Thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome back to Forward Thinking. I'm Ricky Vellante, joined by my co-host, David West. We have another special guest joining us today, Clarence Bucky McGill, one of the members of the Syracuse 8. So we're going to be diving into their their previous boycott and also what's been happening today. So Bucky, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Obviously, as I just mentioned, you were one of the members of the Syracuse 8, even though there were nine of you, but you, you, you all accomplished something really significant in 1970 at Syracuse. And as we've seen over the course of this weekend, you know, boycotting and and coming together as a, as a group of athletes has the uh, significant ability to change things. But want to go into your backstory, what made you want to participate with the Syracuse 8 and how that sort of impacted the rest of your life? Okay, well, uh, when I went to Syracuse University on a uh, football grant and aid scholarship, uh, it was in the late 60s. And people have to understand that during the late 60s, there were tumultuous times. You know, you can say things like Kent State, uh, Woodstock, Vietnam, Martin Luther King, uh, Malcolm X, John Kennedy. Uh, you can go on and on and on with the, the, the activities and the civil disobedience that, you know, permeated the, the late 60s, 1960s. So at that time, uh, I was at Syracuse University in 1967 uh, as a freshman. After the 1968 season, uh, I was a starting defensive end at Syracuse my uh, junior year, part of my sophomore year. And that was a big thing at that time because you may recall the NCAA had freshman teams. At that Mm -hmm. time, so every school had a freshman team and no one could play varsity. You had to play your first year as a freshman. So for myself to start as a defensive end, that was a big thing at that time. So, But I was a defensive end for Syracuse University. Well, kind of some strange things started happening. You know, our coaching staff verbally told us not to date white women. I have to say I was I was going to date white women. My mother, my stepmother was white. My half of my family is white. So that was kind of strange. 
Uh, I have a lovely African American wife of 35 years right now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but for the coaching staff to have the audacity to right. dictate, you know, your, your social behavior, that was kind of that. I took me back. You have to realize I'm from Binghamton, New York, upstate New York, and anecdotal and structural and systematic racism. I didn't see, you know, not to say it wasn't there. My older brother and older sister say they confronted it, but I didn't because I was a good student. I was president of, uh, of the uh, student government. I was an athlete, uh, you know, and I was really popular in that regard. So uh, we didn't have that animosity from a race perspective. We had about 1,500 students and about 12 of those students were black. And the uh, top student was a, a, a black kid who went on to Harvard Law School. So I didn't experience uh, those real difficult times similar to my wife when I hear her story. She's from Richmond, Virginia. So when I went to Syracuse University, my re- first hard confrontation with you know, the racial disorder syndrome, if you will, uh, was at Syracuse. Mm. So realized that our coach, Ben Swartzwater, was one of the top coaches in the country. He won a uh, national championship in 1959. He had the first African-American uh, Heisman Trophy winner, who was Ernie Davis. And he was pretty, you know, pretty well respected as a coach. But his West Virginia background and some of the things that they wanted us to do, uh, like they would uh, give us a curriculum just to keep us eligible versus uh, matriculating with a degree, they would do a lot of strange things that were kind of disorienting to me. So, and not only myself, the other nine players that were on the team also didn't feel that we were being respected from a racial perspective. So what we decided to do in the, in the late 60s was boycott spring ball. So in 1970, we boycotted uh, our spring ball and we made some demands. And the demands were that we were going to, we wanted you know, fair treatment uh, in terms of being uh, used on the football field. I don't know if you knew this, but uh, in the late 60s, if uh, a black player from Syracuse University played the University of Alabama in Alabama, and that black player scored a touchdown, there would be a near riot. <laughs> so a lot of things that NCAA coaches knew not to do, they followed the pattern. You know, you can only have so many black players on the field that a certain time, you couldn't let them score, and et cetera. So one was that we wanted, yes, that's right. <laughs> one that we wanted, you know, fair play in terms of playing on the field and, and earning time justifiably. Two was uh, we wanted uh, equal medical treatment. Uh, we had a doctor who was the head of our athletic department, our, our athletic medical department, that was a gynecologist. He knew nothing about, <laughs> that's right, he knew nothing about uh uh, you know, the, the general practicing of uh, athletic program. The third thing we wanted was, you know, fair academic treatment. Our, in which I mentioned, we our academic counselors were our coaches. I know you heard of that. And, uh, again, uh, we wanted, uh, you know, the proper academic type of guidance. And we also asked for a black coach. You know, Syracuse was uh, originated in 1870. They hadn't had a black in their athletic department ever. So we wanted to demand, we demanded a black coach. And uh, those were our basic four demands. When Jim Brown found out about it, I mean, Jim Brown, he was uh, coached by the same coach that we were coached by, Ben Schwarzwalder. And Jim came to town in the late 60s, 1970, to try to play a mediator to work with the coaches and work with us in regards to resolving the situation. That didn't work with Jim because Jim found resistance like we had experienced. But during that time, we became very close to Jim Brown. Jim stayed there for about a week and we played basketball and did certain things. We played one-on-one basketball. He took my money, $70. And I asked him, are you going to take my money from (laughs) from a student? (laughs) And he took my money, turned his back and left. (laughs) <laughs> and uh you know we had races you know uh, track races in the gym and jim was pretty fast because he uh 
uh, equal to the, our fastest player in, in the 40 in the, in the uh, gymnasium. And he was retired at that time. I think he was a few years retired. So with that in mind, gyms tried to mediate and, and it didn't work. Uh, so in essence, we sacrificed our professional careers. Now, I was uh, pretty sure I was going to be drafted. I had teams talking to me. Um, my junior year, and uh, of course, I probably would have started my senior year and uh, improved, if you will. But we decided one night, Jim Brown came just before he left, and he said, hey, you guys are going to lose a lot with the NFL. You're going to lose this. You're going to lose that. He said, I'm going to come back here in the morning, and I want you to make a decision. And whatever decision you make, I'm going to support. So we stayed up that night crying and fighting and uh, just trying to uh, you know, understand exactly where we were. But that morning, uh, we stayed up all night. And that morning, we decided we are not going to let this happen to any other players coming to Syracuse University. So we're going to make a stand here. And that's what we did. Once we made that stand, you know, fortunately, we had you know a, a backing of uh, faculty that supported us. There were two commissions that were going on, the uh, Human Rights Commission, the New York Human Rights Commission, and also a commission uh, developed by the Chancellor, Chancellor Corbley, to look at the uh, the racial situation in the athletic department. Both uh, commission bodies, both bodies confirmed that there was racism in the athletic department, but uh, nothing actually happened with that, actually. And uh, Corbley, uh, Chancellor Corbley, lost his job because he was fighting the uh, athletic department. So it's one of those situations uh, that you usually find the uh, athletic the uh, coach, the coaches are uh, have more power than the, than the chancellor. So I left, but I did get a degree. I went on to graduate school, and many of us didn't go on to uh, graduate school. We all received our degrees, and again, that was based on the uh, supported faculty and friends uh, within the Syracuse community and within the Syracuse uh, University community that supported us to make sure we kept our scholarships you know, while we were uh, going through school. So I didn't go back to Syracuse. I left there. Didn't want to see the university, the city again. And then in uh, 2006 or 30 something years later, Chancellor Nancy Cantor, who's now at Rutgers, she heard about this Syracuse 8 situation. Everybody's heard about it at Syracuse, but not too much outside of Syracuse. So she wanted to know more about it. So she asked a gentleman who was working for the uh, Syracuse uh, Publishing House, and that you know, Syracuse University Publishing uh, House is pretty pretty popular. And she asked uh, one of the uh, writers to take a sabbatical, research the Syracuse Eight thing, and you know, find out what happened. So that gentleman's name was David Mark, and he was the author of the book Leveling the Playing Field: The Story of the Syracuse Eight. And when he uh, researched everything, he had access to the Syracuse University archives in which the chancellor allowed. Now, no one has ever had access to the Syracuse University archives. Syracuse University was created to educate African-Americans, women, and Native Americans initially in the 18, late 1800s, developed by abolitionists named Garrison. And that's the way the university started. So the university had a thing that they would copy everything. Even before the copy machine, there were copies made and duplicates, and they were uh, treasured and, and filed in the Syracuse archives. So not a lot of people had access to the Syracuse archives, but Nancy Cantor allowed uh, David Mark to get into the archives and you know find out information in regards to research for the book. David told me, who, and David has passed, unfortunately, a couple of years ago, but David told me that when he would come out of that archives, he'd be crying like a baby because of the information and the, the racial information that was so negative. He, he just couldn't believe it. So if you read our book, you will get some of the, that history. So like I say, in the 2006 or so, after David Mark researched the project and Nancy asked David to write a book about the project, and also she wanted all of us to come back, those that were alive, because uh, there's uh, six of us now, three of us have passed, but at that time, only one had passed. And she was going to give us the Chancellor's Medal of Extraordinary Courage, which is the highest honor uh, that you can receive in New York State. Actually, Joe Biden has it, so if he becomes president, <laughs> I join him. Uh, so at that time, because 
of her, you know, sincere uh, feelings. And she said they were going to have an official apology, which I'm not in apologies, but they did do it or whatever it's worth. And um, they were going to give us the medal and we we're going to have a dinner and just have a full weekend of celebration. So with that in mind, uh, we all came back. Uh, Jim Brown was there and others were there that supported us in our endeavors. And uh, we received the uh, that extraordinary medal of courage. So basically, that, that's about a 50-year story. And this year uh, is our 50th anniversary. So Syracuse University was doing a big thing. It's called Coming, Coming Back Together. And usually the uh, Black and Latino alumni get together every three years and have a big celebration. But because of COVID, we're not having that. And also the university's anniversary is the 150th year of the uh, of the university's existence. So this was going to be a big thing with the 150th year of the university and the 50th year of uh, our uh, boycott. So it's going to be virtual, but obviously it's going to be nowhere near, you know, the, the, the celebration and ceremony that it could have been, you know, if we all were together. That, I mean, that's, a, that's an incredible story. And part of it, you know, I've, I've heard about you know, what you guys did, but I didn't know some of the more intricate details, didn't know, you know Jim Brown's involvement. I've heard he was been, he's been involved in a few of these different types of things throughout that era. But I got a question just about what, two-part question. So what were, the com, what were the conversations like amongst you guys as players? You know, you're, 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 you have your whole athletic future in front of you. What were those conversations like as young athletes? And then the other part is, what was the toughest moment? So I know you mentioned a few different moments where, you know, you had the night where you had to make the decision. You act, you know, you had Jim Brown at that time, who was, a, I think he probably was a Hollywood star. He's pretty famous. Yeah. So you have him coming, yeah. bringing national attention to it. You know, you obviously have the media, the backlash of the media. You have the moments afterward where maybe you realize, you know, you may not have a, a shot at being professional or whatever. So what was that? What what was the toughest moment in all of that? Well, in terms of our conversations, and for me, I I really don't have any regrets. And they say that's kind of interesting about all of us. We, we don't seem to have any regrets. I mean, of course, I would like to play ball. I would right. I would have been pretty good, uh, I think. But in terms of the uh, the toughest conversation, it was just you know explaining to family members, particularly when they thought that I would lose my scholarship because there was a little time period that we didn't know, you know, whether we would continue our scholarships. And for me, I was, I had uh, offers to other places and I was thinking about, you know, I had offers to Tennessee, you know, uh, West Point and Wyoming. And I was going to go to Wyoming. And I don't know if you know about Wyoming, but Wyoming also, they had a, uh, a bout with uh, Coach Lloyd Eaton who threw all of them off the team just because they wanted to wear a black armband uh, uh, at the uh, Brigham Young game because Brigham Young didn't want to deal with black folks in different ways. Right. So, uh, you know, I was born dead. But but my main, my difficult conversation was just convincing my family that, you know, this was the, my, my decision and this is what I wanted to do. Uh, in regards to uh, the most difficult time, there was a gentleman that I, my roommate, uh, his name was John Willie Godbolt. And he was out of uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut. And John Gobble was a very, very good athlete. He was big. He was strong. He was quick. Uh, he could run over you. He could run around you. And he was super fast. And my coach, Ben Sportswater, didn't like his style of play. Ben Sportswater liked the uh, Larry Zonka style. Run straight ahead. Run. Right. He doesn't want you to dance. You know, he, you know, you've heard this. He doesn't want you to dance around. And and John could uh was you know pretty comprehensive with all his skills, and I really saw Ben Swarthwell and the athletic staff really take him under a deep depression because because you know and you've seen this because he wouldn't he wasn't the type of player they wanted the pattern of Sy of a Syracuse with Larry Zonka type and I saw John over the years you know just his, his mental. Uh, capacity to handle just to, for him to uh, just submit to right. uh, the coach's demands and for him to try to change his style. And, you know, eventually, you know, he just became uh, severely depressed and uh, that's the lost his mind. And that really hurt me and hurt all of us because, you know, you play with somebody that you see is great. You play with players that you see are great. 
and you know you can play, but you know they have a little special, what they call a little special it. Right. <laughs> and uh, eventually, um, that was very uh, hard for me to, 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 to experience because he was my roommate, especially, and also I was young. So I didn't know anything about mental health and depression. And, you know, as I became older, uh, there were signs that I felt that maybe I should have responded to and if I knew, if I wasn't so ignorant to, to, to uh, right. depression, just the, the, uh, the syndrome of depression. So uh, that was probably my most trying moment was just watching him, you know, even though he wasn't playing, he, you know, he was in the, the dormitory and, you know, in the morning, you know, he'd be sleeping. When I come back from classes at four or five in the afternoon, the, the room would be dark and he'd still be in the bed. So he, mm. he was a broken man. And uh, that was uh, very disheartening and very hard to do. During the boycott itself and then afterwards, a number of athletes, uh, teammates of yours, really, that, that especially some of the white teammates, spoke out against what you all tried to accomplish. How difficult was that? You know, sort of being, especially in a sport like football, where you're sort of in the trenches with each other, but to have them sort of turn their back on you. Well, you know, it's interesting because when we were going through the boycott, the coaching staff had all the white ball players sign a petition, basically that they wouldn't play with us. Uh, and so it's a different, it's a little different times than uh, what's going on now, especially University of Missouri and how the black players and coaches, uh, you know, came together, but. So the coach encouraged the white players to sign petitions. I have those petitions. I have the names. And one of the uh, players, his name was uh, Joe Ehrman. I don't know. You might know Joe Ehrman. He played for the uh, Baltimore Colts for about 15 years, and he was a captain. And he was also the captain of, the, of our football team. And he and I played next to each other. I was the left defensive end, and he was the left defensive tackle. So over the years, Joe and I have kind of ran into each other in different venues. And Joe is, uh, you know, very remorseful. And, you know, he has said many times publicly and through his books, uh, he's got this uh, book uh, series on how to coach with love. And, and he's also involved with the NFL. But he has uh, documented and voiced his displeasure for, for what he did. And he's... He's very apologetic and very sorry, and he always says, "I wish I knew what was going on because I would have stood with you." And so that's that's uh, you know unique because Joe might be the only one, as I as I uh, am aware. I would love to talk to all those guys that you know I played ball with at that time in, in, in college because we were pretty close for a couple you know two and a half years or so. But those are uh, th that's the situation with the, our white ball players. And Joe has some stuff on YouTube, and he's got a lot of stuff that he's, uh, you know, he's been very open and very public. Uh, you know, and Joe's just become a, a, a pretty good man. Also, let me uh, just 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 be, be mindful that, you know, there were about 150 they claim athletic protests in the late 60s. You know, there were like University of Washington, University of Texas. Wyoming, of course, Indiana, Buffalo, Pittsburgh, I think Texas, California, Oregon State. We can go on and on and on. And I was really uh, talking with David Mark, and I wanted to research all those protests, but unfortunately he passed away. But that was one of the real, real, I guess, uh, unfortunate things. He passed away, but I wanted to research uh, all those uh, protests and see just where they went. Uh, it's interesting you talk about uh, what's going on with the Pac-12. Uh, we can talk about what happened uh, uh, with the University of Missouri in 2015, you know. And then you can go on and on just dealing with athletes from historically because talk about Jack Johnson and their different times. You can talk about Jackie Robinson. Then you go into Bill Russell, different times. And then and then in our we, – we, I guess we we're sort of Bill Russell and the – and, and others, you know, there's so many you can name. I'm just naming a few. But then you get till now, when you talk about LeBron James and, and the Williams sisters, you know, I always say there's a difference with their protest because they're in the boardroom now. They're in, they're, they're in the room. <laughs> none of these other players, none of these other athletes were in the room. So uh, it does make a difference when the, the athletes that are, have a sensitivity towards justice and, and right are, uh, 
our African Americans that are in the room with the CEOs and the presidents. What What was your response to? I know you talk about the, the white players that didn't support you, but what about the response of the, of the black players that didn't support you? Because I know there were, there had to be some. And, and so what was your reaction to that? There were two players, black players, that didn't, didn't uh, boycott. And we spoke to them. They're brothers. And basically, they said they supported us, but they couldn't do what we were doing because of their family situation. They had to really be mindful and really have this their scholarships uh, has a priority because they could not continue school without a scholarship, without money, without mm. the funding support. Like, as I said, we found out later in, in, in the situation that we kept our scholarships. Right. But at the time that we were uh, making you know, our, our stand, uh, we didn't know what was going to happen. And again, at the time uh, of the situation, we sat and spoke to them in, in depth and we, we respected their decision, and we, we hold no animosity towards the decision they made with their family. And now looking to today, you know, the story is still developing. Obviously, we haven't reached the actual point of a boycott. It's just a threatened boycott with a list of demands at this point. But what's your perspective on what, what took place over the weekend with the Pac-12 and, and what sort of fight these players have coming towards them, given your experiences? Well, what I read is that they really have some uh, very poignant demands and requests and issues. They, they cover the gambit of, of the arena in terms of, you know, you know su support and, and funding support when they do leave school, if they're injured. I mean, there's a potpourri of, uh, of, of issues they speak about. I don't believe in last I heard they were supposed to present uh, their demands to the Pac-12 board, and I don't know if they have or not. But the, the main, I think that your, your main characteristic when you get into a, a an, an administrative fight for a racial justice is that you really have to be together, you have to be solid, and you have to at one point make a commitment to follow through to the end. You have to be able and be ready to sacrifice. And some young folks aren't ready to sacrifice, like you know the Martin Luther Kings and the and and others that have been involved in. You know, you talk about John Lewis. Who who made such a, any more of a great sacrifice than John Lewis in his lifetime? And he was a man of integrity. So you're going to have to do it in the same way he did it. You have to have a sense of integrity, a sense of honesty a sense of my career is going to die. So it's a possibility. It's something I need to risk, but it's also something I need to do. And these players need to understand that if you're going to be involved in this, in this type of confrontation, you need to be committed to follow it through right to the end. That's one thing Jim Brown taught us, and I'll never forget. Because Jim Brown, if he gets involved... He's more loyal <laughs> and more into the movement than you may be. <laughs> and if you're not into the movement as much as he thinks you should be, Jim going to do something to you. <laughs> he, 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 I mean, he was that type of person in his, uh, uh, you know, in his youth or earlier days. So that's one thing that was very evident in any type of uh, social, I mean, or civil disobedience. Is that you go and you go to the end and you commit yourself and you commit yourself to everybody, not just yourself, but everybody's a team player or everybody's a civil disobedience player. And you have to go to the end. And, and that's what Jim Brown taught me personally. And that's what I also uh, observed with John Lewis and the other great civil rights uh, leaders. Another broad question. Obviously, the money has changed college football just to stick to that is is a bigger business than than obviously than when you played but in terms of representation within coaching staffs administrations the decision maker level across the board with college football do you feel like enough progress has been made or that really obviously progress has been made since there were staffs that had no black coaches now there are at least some but you know what's your your takeaway on sort of the status of things in terms of representation well, for me, first of all, the now is the future. And I say that, that this presidential election is really going to show the moral fiber of this country 
in terms of its outcome. And uh, that's going to be significant. In terms of your, your question about what, what's going on now, and uh, I believe it's, it's, there's a, a commitment. I'm, I'm not sure that things have changed significantly. Of course, they've changed because life is changed. Time is changed. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, some of these uh, athletes are in the boardroom make, helping to make decisions. But you know, I, I, I go back to the the history of athletes, black athletes being involved in civil disobedience. You know, again, I go back to the Jesse Owenses and the and, and the, the Marion Motleys and the Earl Lloyds and the and and, and the uh, Arthur Ashes and, and currently the folks today, Kaepernick, you know, look at look at Kaepernick and look at look how the whole world is on their knee. <laughs> The whole world is has respected what he did. Now, again, you know, you, you look at that, and then you look at the other side that the president wants uh, Confederate flags, you know, at his convention. So, I, I'm not sure what progress is because it's sort of like playing two chessboards. You know, one you're winning and one you're losing. So I don't know how that pans out. What's your general sense on the role that athletes play and in their ability to bring light and highlight certain issues? Have we made progress in that more athletes are willing to speak out, in your opinion, and more than they have in the past? Well, yes, uh, I like where we are. You, again, you look back at the turn of the 20th century and you had the Jack Johnsons who, you know, were – you know, fighting just to be involved, just to participate. And then you had, you know, post-World War II where you had the Jackie Robinson and, and they were struggling, you know, just for access. And then you had the middle 60s where there was a struggle for dignity and respect. And then you have now today where, again, they certain athletes are involved in the decision-making of, 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 of business uh, directions. So with that, there has been progress. And there will continue to be progress as long as these athletes, uh, black athletes, are involved in the boardroom. It, it's really interesting that the the context and the history and the uh, chronological uh, improvement in regards to athletes from Jack Johnson to, you know, LeBron James or, or, or the Williams sisters, how it's progressed. And it's always the athletes who expose things because they have the stage. You know, right. they have a stage for competition. You know, they have a stage for uh, perfection. Uh, but they also uh, can change that stage for uh, civil disobedience right. and uh, civil justice if they wish. Sometimes I question young folks because uh, sometimes young folks are happy with the money and the status and the women and everybody else. And that's understandable to a certain extent. But way back when, when we talked about uh, the folks that I just mentioned in history, you know, they liked the status and the money and the women, but they also were committed to their own people's dignity and their own people's improvement. That's, that was the difference. They weren't afraid to sacrifice and they weren't afraid to die. And I think that's the difference, could be the difference, because there's a lot of young folks that, that have that ability and have that ability to, to uh, be on a stage and say things and do things. And so some of them choose not to do it. You've seen that many times when uh, they have opted to do uh, to not do it right. So if you think about, you know, where we can improve, you know, where can we, I guess, where can we find the silver lining in all of this and, how far do you think, you know, athletes' roles? You know, I know you talked about not having regrets. I don't know if you had that conversation with uh, the other gentleman involved in what you did back in 1970, but where does where are the limits to the athletes' role in all of this? Because I always say, look, the athletes aren't the guys making the decisions. Even though LeBron James and Serena and them might be involved in some decisions, they're not the legislators, they're not the politicians. So, you know, what, what, at what point do the athletes run into that place where they say, okay, we've done all we can do now that the folks who are in positions to do these, to make these changes, make them? Well, my response to that, the athletes cannot do that. Athletes need to be the leaders. You know, mm -hmm. they, they, uh, uh, they, they influence the decision, you know, so 
any decisions that are made in the boardroom that they know that is not in, in concert with uh, you know, civil rights, they need to voice it and they need to fight against it. You mm-hmm. know, if, if LeBron James said, don't buy any more uh, Adidas sneakers, everybody black don't go in the Adidas store for two months. Yeah. What you think they're going to do? They're going to make LeBron James president of Adidas. <laughs> I mean, the, the power of our, our black hand economically is great. You know, the, the, the athlete is the leader. I don't care who's in the boardroom. I don't care who's the president. I don't care who's the vice president. What they say, and if they got together, like the old crew used to be, Jim Brown and, and Bill Russell and Kareem, and you remember them around Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, they were together. We have to learn from the past, and we have to learn what was the success in the past. So uh, I'm, I'm a little, I'm from the, uh, a different school that uh, these athletes need to lead, and, and and they need to, you know, take charge, have their strategic plan together. Everybody needs to meet together, plan together, and and make sure that there is success uh, now and 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 in the future. And being on the same page is a critical part of that. Critical, critical, and 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 African Americans, we are on it. If you take any three men, and then take another three men, that's six men, and say play one on one basketball in the park, three on three. We all know how to play three on three basketball. We know the rules. We know if we hit somebody, you respect the call. We we know everything, and we play together. And 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 the, you know the game goes on. It's a fierce game, but when it's all over, everybody laughs and says congratulations. That's the way we need to be in this social justice arena. We need to play together, win together, and respect each other when we win. Right. Appreciate the time. The only I do have one question. What What is the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning? What is your? Uh... I try to pray. I try to pray in the morning. I try to pray at night. All right. I to I that's what I. That's what I try to do. That's your secret secret formula. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it's a secret formula, but, <laughs> but the Bible says you better do it. So. I got you. I got you. Well, we really appreciate the time, Bucky. This has been great, and thank you, thank you again for making the time. My pleasure, and uh, anytime. So thank you so much for your time and asking me to speak. We appreciate it. And welcome back to Forward Thinking. I'm Ricky Vellante, joined by my co-host, David West. We have another special guest this evening joining us. We have Kevin Blackstone professor at University of Maryland's Philip Merrill College of Journalism, a columnist at the Washington Post, regular panelist on ESPN's Around the Horn, and contributor at NPR. Kevin, thank you for joining us. Thank you for for the invite. So we usually like to start things off with. Hearing a little bit about how you got into sports and uh, your journey to covering the games. Sure. Well, um, I never anticipated covering sports. It just kind of fell out the sky. I was covering economics at the time at the uh, Dallas Morning News, um, where I'd been about five years. And it was the early 90s. And I had just come back from, uh, I'd actually just come back from covering Nelson Mandela's tour of the U.S. And the sports editor, for whom I had written a few stories on the economics of sports, wanted to start up a beat on the economics of sports. So he, asked me if I'd be interested. And um, I initially said no. And I was also at the time thinking about heading back to DC, which is where I'm from, which is where I'm talking to you today. because I had a couple offers from like the Washington Post and USA Today. And then he sweetened the deal by saying, we have a columnist who's about to leave and we're trying to figure out how to fill that space. And so would you be interested in also writing a column once a week? I was like, ooh, that sounds interesting. So I talked to a few people, and it was an opportunity that I really couldn't say no to. And I'm a sports fan anyway. And so from that day till this, I've been been writing sports 99.9% of the time. 
And then you made the transition being on camera as well. I don't think you were technically one of the original panelists of Around the Horn, but you weren't far off. So how how was that how did that going from? Yeah, that was really just about being in the right place at the right time. So I forget what year PTI started up, but one year after PTI got going, their ratings were so were so outrageous that ESPN wanted to lock up that whole hour, right? And so they decided to start a, a show that mimicked it, but with more people. And they came up with this idea of Around the Horn having columnists from around the country. And they needed, they, they wanted columnists from big newspapers, but they also wanted newspapers that had a turnkey broadcast operation so they wouldn't have to go in and build out everything. And fortunately, at the Dallas Morning News, which at that time was, we were probably the largest sports section in the country. I mean, it's crazy how many people we had and how many editions we put out. We covered everything. We were also owned by Belo Corporation, which is a broadcasting company. We're right next door to a TV station. They had just built out a brand new TV operation in the in the back of the building that was huge. And so we had the fiber optic technology as i understand it whereas where espn could just come in basically plug in adjust a few things and we're good to go right out of the newsroom and uh tim callishaw and i were the i guess you could say the main columnist or whatever at, at the paper and so they tapped they tapped us so tim did it for the first you know month or so and then or two months or however long it was and then i got into the rotation and it's just been flowing ever since so you, I mean, you cover sports, but you don't stick to sports, so to speak. So <laughs> was that sort of just naturally out of the way that you've done investigative writing that you started looking at the broader picture? Or was that something that was always there? You know, it was something that was always there. I mean, you know, my my attraction to journalism was through the importance that it has in life, right? I. I um I'm a Watergate baby. So and and I was a, a newspaper boy. So when I was slinging newspapers, the Washington Post in the in the 1970s um early mid 1970s uh when I was going to high school, I was infatuated by by the Watergate. You know, the the Watergate case. And I I was reading about it and I used to have a little radio that I taped to my uh cart that I would use when I was going around the neighborhood delivering papers. I was always listening to the news. I would get home from, from school and, uh, and, and turn on the TV at like, you know, 3.30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon or whatever it was when they had the hearings live on TV, um, you know, before going to whatever practice I had to go to. And I knew at that moment, um, just watching the power of the Washington Post bringing down the Nixon administration, that that's what I wanted to, to do. It also helped that I had a, had a father who was very politically active and uh, was a frequent writer of letters to the editor and op-eds. Um, I used to call him a, an epistolary activist because that's, that's, that was one of his strong suits. And so I, I was always drawn to, to journalism. And, I, and so when I was, it was time to go to college, I started looking around for journalism colleges you know, flipping through this, there used to be this huge book in the counselor's office. It was like this big, looked like a, looked like a New York phone book back in the day. And it had descriptions of every college, university and college in the, in the country, broke it down, what they did and everything like that. And, and, um, I knew I wanted to be, I didn't want to be at home. I knew I wanted to be near a big city and I wanted to be on a campus that had a black student population with some history of activism. And looking through this book, I honed in on Northwestern University, right next to Chicago, had a reputation for having a good journalism school, and had a black student organization called For Members Only, which famously in the late 1960s or early 70s, I can't quite remember when, um, they took over the bursar's office for like three days or something like that on campus demanding you know, black student courses, black student faculty to work with black students, that kind of thing. And so I was really impressed. So I was like, that's where I want to go. Right. And never having been to Chicago before in my life, 
you know, I got in, I'm out there, and and it was great. It was everything I thought. Now, how now how important is is black journalism? And I don't want to necessarily pigeonhole you and say, mm-hmm. but how important is black journalism and having the perspectives of black journalists uh, available for everyone? Because a lot of times people think that black journalists should only write for black <laughs> people, right? right. As opposed right. to the general public. So how important is black journalism? It is critical. It's critical. If I did not bring my lens and my experience to the journalism that I produce, then there's really no reason for a publication to employ me because then I'm just doing what everybody else is doing. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's critically important because we see things differently. We are more sensitized to certain issues and events that journalists who are not black just can't bring to the table or don't bring to the table. You know, I always point back to um, the uh, Kerner Commission report in the late 1960s, which was the government's report on the uprisings in urban areas all across America in the aftermath of, uh, of MLK's assassination. And the only industry that they pointed a finger at an accusatory finger at was the media. And one of their observations was that the media didn't have the temperature of urban America, Mm. did not sense that it was about to boil over. And the reason it didn't was largely because it didn't have journalists of color, didn't have black journalists who were, who would be comfortable going into those communities and talking to people and find out what their concerns are. And so they made a recommendation. They said, news media in this country needs to be diversified. Mm-hmm. If it's going to be, if it's going to truly reflect all of what there is in this country. And so, you know, it is, it is critically important. And, uh, you know, it also plays a real importance in, in sports too, because I think that most that that many people in this country get their impression about black folks and black life from what they see athletes do on television or at the stadium or at the arena or maybe through entertainers right and that becomes their their viewpoint and so if if only white writers or white journalists are crafting that framework right it can be distorted. It can be misunderstood. It can be overlooked. Um, but yet that, that creates an image for the rest of the country as to what they think about people of color or others. So, you know, it's, it's really, um, you know, it's really, really important in, um, in, in sports. And so I have a, you know, before I was a sports writer, I covered economics Right. I covered hard news, and in Chicago, I did investigative reporting into racial and social issues at a at a publication uh, um, called the Chicago Reporter, which is still around. It's a great publication; they win a ton of awards. They it's um, they have a website now and everything. It's a great place to be or to have been. But you know, I'm not I'm not a I'm not a trained critical race theorist. Right. But I think I have an amateur critical. <laughs> race lens right through which right. i i view a lot of things right yeah I, i've always felt um particularly in sports um as an athlete or from the athlete side you always are a bit more comfortable when you walk in when you see that clutch of reporters and you see that there are black reporters in the midst because um there's always a chance that your words may m- get misconstrued uh particularly if you're young like if you're young and i, I saw um I think you know mike mike wells um mm-hmm. in, in indianapolis but he was a guy and he handled lance stevenson in a way that i was like if this dude wasn't a black dude he wouldn't <laughs> be able to get you know understand what lance is trying to say and i would see mike do that from time to time but that sort of from a first-hand experience i was able to see how important it was to have you know a a a brother, so to speak, right? Sure. Sort of trying to communicate the words of this young athlete who may not necessarily uh, be able to get him 
you know, get him across as clear as he'd like. But then Mike would say, I know what you mean, and then represent him the right way. It's so always felt like it was very important to have that connectedness as well. And then just sort of to piggyback on that, if you think about sports and you think about sort of where the society is, what role do you, you, do you see sports play in sort of uh, – this landscape that we call American society and how is that, how has that changed over the years of, you know, from in your life, from the time of, you know, early on, maybe not covering sports, but observing how sports well, played a, a role. Um, and how have you seen that evolve? Well, I teach a course I developed about, uh, I developed in the wake of, in the aftermath of Colin Kaepernick, August, 2016, first protesting. And I call it, the course is called sports protest in media. And what it is, is, is this, it's a survey course about the history of protests in sports, which, as a shock to the students who take it, had a life long before right. Colin Kaepernick, right? Even long before Carlos and Smith and long before Muhammad Ali. And then we talk about the role that sports plays in society, what it is, role that media plays in society. Um, and how important that is. And we talk about what protest is and what protest isn't. And what I try to explain through, through narratives as well as social science is that sports is a natural platform for protests. That in fact, sports has roots, a lot of things that happen in sports have roots in protests. And, and the way the sports are organized make them a natural fit for protests. Right. I even go back to, um, to, the, to the etymology of the word sport, which comes from the word disport. And the word disport means, it means like to have frolic and whimsy away from the daily toil of life something to distract you. So when people say that they are uncomfortable or, or they don't want to see serious issues in the sports arena, there's a real reason for that. It's because we've been conditioned to believe that sports is an escape from everything else. And when you take the media and you put it in the mix and you see how difficult it is for sports media to handle these these meaty issues, well, there's a reason for that too. Because for so long in the 20th century, sports reporting was purposely not done to be a part of everything else in the, in the newspaper. When the, in the 1920s, the golden age of, of sports writing and the, the huge, the golden age of newspapers, when you know every city had six, seven newspapers and they're competing for readers all the time, <laughs> One of the things that editors and publishers found out was that their audiences would ebb and flow with the political conversations of the day. But sports, people were attracted to that no matter what. And so they made a concerted effort to keep politics and serious issues out of sports because they didn't want to um, drive off potential readers and lose circulation. And so that was true pretty much until the, until the you know, 1970s, 1980s, when there started to be some investigative reporting in sports journalism, and uh, people started asking questions and looking under the rug and starting to ask some real questions about the whole organization of this game. Right. So, there's a, you know, so there's a long you know, history to kind of sports being, being in this kind of prophylactic, right, from from everything else in society. Touching on the role of sports and also touching on sort of the way in which athletes who are especially predominantly black in, in basketball and football portrayed, how much of that ties back, in your opinion, to the system of amateurism forcing these underrepresented, exploited individuals to go through this system where they cannot be compensated, nor do they receive the same academic benefits that their other students receive. And then how does that feed into the portrayal of these athletes, as we're seeing right now, them being forced sure. to play in a pandemic? I'm, I'm like a big fan of history. 
and, and that's what journalism is, right? We're current day historians. But I love I love history, and I I honed in on African American history when I was in grad school at, at Boston University. And and now that I've been teaching it for the last ten years, I've, I've been looking at it even more closely. And so there are a few things that just jump out to me off the historical timeline that lead up to this. Number one is the second time that enslaved Africans or the progeny of enslaved Africans were ever in the media. The, the first time was as chattel slaves on the cla- in the classified section. The second time was as athletes. And the, af- the athletes that they were were jockeys. And if you look at early newspapers when they first report on horse racing, they refer to these, th- these jockeys are known as slave jockeys. And they, they rarely are named. It's just, it might be slave boy rode this horse, right? The horse gets a name, the slave does not. And then over time, it became a way for, as, as slaves began to dominate horse racing, um, it became a way for them to purchase their freedom. They were good enough, got enough money, an owner would, would allow them to buy their way off the plantation. So the, so the history of, of the, the black athlete in this country is as someone who has, to, who has to use sport to liberate as an idea of liberation, liberation for himself or herself. And you think about, you think about the, the narrative that we always read in the paper or see on um, television about sport being the savior for this black athlete, particular black male. Uh, right. If not for sport, he'd be dealing drugs on the corner. If not for sport, he'd be in jail. If not for sport, he'd be shot dead. If not for sport, right? So that's that's one thing. And then, so 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 that's this this element of of control, right? And so you see that at the turn of the last century with Jack Johnson, mm-hmm. when he refuses to be controlled, right? He fights for this opportunity to, to do something to know. Black man had been allowed to do in the history of this country, fight for the World Heavyweight Championship, and he does it, and he wins it, and then they flip the script on him to get control of him again. And then through the, I always find it fascinating that in the first half of the last century, who are the, who are the most celebrated black athletes of the first half of the last century? They all have something in common. So you get Joe Lewis. You get Jesse Owens and you get Jackie Robinson. And there's a thread for me between the three of them. And that is that they were all celebrated, not only because they were great athletes, but maybe more importantly, because they were the the media exemplified them to the rest of the country as a way for black men to behave, no matter how bad. No matter how bad shit is, look at Jackie Robinson. You you turn the other cheek. You're you're not the Jackie Robinson in 1944, who wound up court-martialed in the army because you refused an officer's demand that you give up your seat on a segregated bus because you were sitting next to a white woman who wasn't a white woman, just happened to be a light-skinned black woman, right? You know, you 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 turn the other cheek for this this opportunity. You know, Joe Lewis got used and abused by the government, you know, Jesse Owens, you know, he was, he was always portrayed as this, you know, this non-confrontational, you know, athlete. So, so there's that. And then you get into the second half of the last century and black athletes start to reflect the increasingly confrontational um, nature of the black community through civil rights, right? All of a sudden you have, you know, all of a sudden you have, you know, the, the dawning of the, well, you, first of all, you have the, the 50s when I think that was the time when uh, Rose Robinson was a great track athlete and she refused to, you know, she refused to stand, stand I think, for the national anthem or the flag. And she accused the, the uh, I think it was the AAU at the time of trying to use her like as camouflage for what was happening to black people back in the, back in the, you know, in the country. And, you know, and then you get the 60s, obviously you get Ali, 
Um, he's his own man. You know, Bill, Bill Russell refuses to play a game. The 1965 AFL All-Star game that was supposed to be in uh, New Orleans, the black players get there. Uh, they can't get a cab. They can't get into restaurants. They're like, we're out of here. They shut that down. Um, 68, you get Carlos and Smith. You get the Wyoming, uh, the Wyoming football players throw down, the Syracuse football players throw down. So all of a sudden now you got people fighting back like this, you know, but, but all the time, particularly in college, they're trying to be, they're, they're still being controlled, right? So fast forward to today and what you see right now going on in college football is all about control. I mean, and, and why control? Because it's about the money. And a few weeks ago, I got a leaked tape from an SEC meeting. And it was um, all the athletic honchos, the medical people, and then player reps from each of the schools. And most of the player reps were star players. And the whole thing was about COVID, coming back to play, what's it going to be like. And you can hear the concern on the players. They're like, so if I catch COVID, you know, what does that mean for me in the future? Am I still going to be sick? Am I going to be, you know, we, we've heard something about heart problems. And the SEC people were like, you'll be good. We'll check your heart. You'll be safer in our environment, which could be true. You'll be safer in our environment than out in the general public. Which is kind of funny because basically what they're saying is we're going to test you, we're going to we're going to quarantine you, not quarantine you because you're sick, but keep close tabs on you. We're going to give you we're going to give you those extra benefits <laughs> that that the, we used to penalize for, right? Because you need those. We need to give you these extra benefits because we need to make that cheddar. So yeah, I mean it's. You know, it's all about control. I mean, the money, the money is just, the money is just, you know, it's just crazy. All right. I mean, the NCAA last year, and you all know this, they made somewhere in around a billion dollars. 800 and some million of it was from college basketball, you know. And football, the major networks contract is like about one point. Four billion or something like that, maybe a little bit more, and that doesn't count the playoff tournament, which is I forget I forget how many how many billions that is over a ten or twelve year period or whatever it is. So you know, and they fought tooth and nail not to share any more than than tuition, room, and board with the laborers, right? And it's just you know, and then beyond that. And you look at the, I don't know how many hundreds of coaches now in college football and basketball are now millionaires. They have millionaire salaries. ADs, millionaire salaries. Now everybody's getting paid. Yeah, everybody's getting understood. paid. Right, right. Except, yeah. except, you know, and then on top of that, and this is, it, and this is the, the, the ultimate killer, is that the black male college athlete is the one who is on that gerbil wheel creating all this revenue you know as richard southall likes to say you know there are two sports on the college campus there's revenue generating which is football and basketball and then there are the expenditure sports everything else football and basketball pays for those sports to happen so it's um it's troubling it's all about control to produce to produce revenues you know and then beyond that i'll just throw out one more thing there's a guy named sean harper He's out of USC now. I don't know if you ever read his studies. But, you know, one of the things, interesting things he, he found out about the black male athlete. So the black male athlete is, you know, north of 50%. You know, when you're talking about Power Five conferences, north of 50% of all the rosters on the football rosters and the basketball rosters. But black males on campus, their percentage of the undergraduate enrollment is pretty much less than 3%, which means to me, that for the most part, black male undergraduates are on campus to produce revenue for the, for the college industry. That's the primary function. So it's troubling. It's especially egregious at Auburn and Alabama. 
I haven't looked at this year, but I think over the last couple of years, their football team has come in around like 70 to 80 percent black, but then the student population is less than one and a half percent black. So it's it's especially egregious at some of the SEC yeah. schools who, who sometimes still think they're in the 50s and 60s. So and then the revenue that most recently reported, at least in terms of the Senate committees that have been brought together to to discuss name, image, and likeness, they're reporting that overall college revenues for sports come in just north of fourteen billion when you aggregate it all Every, together. Everything, it's just so stunning. It's, stunning. It's it's a it's a lot. Now, speaking of the historical context, and you, I know you contributed to and and covered uh, some of the player movements that occurred uh, a couple of months ago now. From a historical perspective, did it ever feel like any of these may go as far as, say, the Syracuse 8 did? Did you ever think it, it might come to that? And what's your perspective on these player movements now that we've, frankly, seen them pretty much fizzle out? I mean, we haven't heard anything about them. The right. Pac-12 and the Big Ten are, are going to pick up their games here in a couple of weeks. And, and seemingly, some of the players that were the loudest voices in that, a couple of them I know opted out, but have now you know, made efforts to opt back in so right. that they can come back on campus. So what's your sort of hope or perspective around player movements historically with the Syracuse 8 and then going forward with what we saw this year? Yeah, you know, it's you always wish that college athletes would understand the collective power that they have. But on the other hand, you have to understand that they are teenagers when they get to college campuses right out of high school and that even their parents or guardians sometimes don't realize that power because for a lot of them, and I've had coaches kind of suggest this to me, you know, a lot of parents, they see it kind of as a lottery ticket, right? Get my kid into college. And of course my, my kid is going to be good enough to go to the pros and I'm going to be at the lottery, the draft party. Um, and we know it just doesn't, it just doesn't work like that. And it's just hard for them to, you know, to organize. I mean, I watched, you know, from afar as Kane Coulter tried to do his thing at, at Northwestern a number of years ago and, and what he was up against. And uh, it's just it's just really it's really difficult. But, I, you know, I will say this. I mean, slowly over time, if you just look at from the time that Ramogi Huma started his organization, right, he's been at it now for 20 years, maybe. Something like that. So, you know, there, there's a lot more awareness now about the situation. They've been able to chip away a few things at the, at the NCAA. You know, it's taken things like Ed O'Bannon's lawsuit. The NCAA has come off a few more bucks here and there. I think they've been embarrassed in the public's eye. But, yeah, you still need – the players still need some sort of representation. They still need – some sort of collective voice and you know they still don't have that and it's and they are easily manipulated easily manipulated because i haven't written this yet but i was i've been talking to a a football player at a power five school who's been very upset about a lot of things and he at one point he was so upset this year that he was going to try and have enough of his teammates like walk out of the first game well it didn't happen and they still have a list of demands before the athletic department but he kind of got cold feet because he sees himself in the nfl draft and there are a couple of big games he wants to play to get on tape right to get film and so he's kind of backed away from from doing anything so it's you know it's really and they're in such a tough tough tough, tough place. I mean, David, I mean, you know, you know, the pressure, (laughs) the pressure of being a a college athlete um, who wants to, you know, wants to step out and say something or do something or get, get something changed. Um, Or even just have, you know, a better academic life on campus. Like being, you know, there's this idea that, and this is true, that athletes can get in the front of the line to take classes they want to take. But if those classes are scheduled during during practice time, 
Forget <laughs> it. You doesn't matter. You can be in the front of the line with a twenty dollar bill to give to the friend. You can't. You can't take that class. You can't. You can't do that. So there are a lot of you know. Yeah, it's problematic. And there's been some stories. I mean, we talked about this. I think episode uh, in, in the past we've had, but we've had. There have been some stories of guys, right, who have had to go back and sort of pursue their their academic course uh, that of their choosing after, right, right. after they, they're out of school. Uh, you got to go back right. and sort of do what you want to do then because it just didn't make sense. Yeah, uh, and, then you're, and then you're behind the eight ball right. because now you don't have the internships, right? right you right, didn't right. have the summer work experience or whatever. And so now a class or two or whatever is already, and now you're be- – you're you're behind them trying to catch up, hoping that right. hoping that the school, some alum, some booster will now hook you up. And, <laughs> you right, know. right. And you know the one thing that I know I've talked about sort of regretting in my college experience is not so not being in closer proximity to the actual students. Because if you think about it, and I, I really uh and I tell younger players this now, I'm like, look, man, make sure you know some non sports affiliated people, you know, at the university or at the school. You know, particularly like, you know, some of the business minded people, because here you'll be, you know, 26, 27, 28 years old, got a few million dollars in your pocket. And the guy that you were walking around campus with that started a multi-billion dollar company or is a part of some, you know, and I've always felt like that is a blown opportunity between, you know, potential, potential, uh, you know, especially with guys who who are we know are going to take that professional step. Right. Like. I always think about when Kevin Durant went to Texas, like he's there. And to me, he was like the first guy that was like publicly outside of like the LeBron experience. Like it was like this college experience is a one year deal. And it was talked about. He talked about it. Everybody talked about it. So in that moment, right, he should have been trying to connect with. I mean, you're going to be connected with the basketball people naturally. But these other elements. And I think about that now, like I know I went to school with a few people that have started some successful businesses. And I'm like, man, I would have loved to be able to invest in that thing at the beginning. But I didn't know the guy from, from Larry, you know, and it wasn't, you're not a part of those networks. So, um, you know, that's a benefit. I think that players really don't get an opportunity to participate in, you know, being owned by the schools for these years. And you're not really able to connect with, um, the other elements on campus, right? And, yeah, and if you don't tell them that as an ex-player, you know, right. is the coach going to tell them that necessarily? Is right, right. you know the the people in the um, the learning center going to tell them? I mean, right. who's going to you know? Nah, and that's right. not because that's not that that's not critical in that moment. <laughs> right, 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 right. But you I know? think it's it's highly beneficial for guys, um, and it's again uh, just from a personal standpoint. I know that that's something that. You know, I've had conversations with players about, man, dang, like, you know, because like if you think about think about all of the things, all of these um, things that young people are doing on campuses. And yeah. Educational space. And I always look at folks looking for grants and things like that. And I'm like, man, guys, you know, the guys who are interested could be a part of that world, could connect themselves to you know other parts of you know, academia. And it will translate into other aspects of your life because ultimately we end up like I said, 25, 30 years old and guys are looking for investment outlets, looking for networks outside because now all of a sudden everybody's like, well, you need to be more than an athlete. You need to, right. you know, you need to. And so you've sort of been disconnected from that world that could help you sort of, you know, cultivate that in yourself. So that's just an interesting, it's just an observation yeah. that I've no, That's true. That's, that's real. That's real. So my last thing in terms of what I think some of the the racial components, undertones that are going on on these college campuses is that dependency to the sport and having coaches getting APR bonuses and things along those lines. Like, doesn't it now just become sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy that these athletes are going to be so dependent to their sport that they don't get the opportunity to broaden out? And then if they try to do the very things that David's describing, you know, then you get the stick to sports. Yeah, I mean, I think so. You know, this is an interesting time right now because, I mean, with the current environment, I think a lot of schools are are conscious of that. And so it's kind of like a test period right now because they're letting athletes do a lot of things, right? I mean, Ole Miss guys walking down out of a practice to, to protest a, a Confederate monument on campus, you know, a number of others, some schools on the West Coast, some players did some things. 
we're in an interesting period right now, but at some point this period is going to come to an end. So the question to me is whether or not, you know, how do you transfer that momentum? How do you keep that momentum going? Like, I mean, to your point, how do you keep, how do you even keep it, you know, alive? Because one of the interesting things about the dynamics of a college campus from an administrative standpoint is students are always, they're always student organizations railing about something on campus. I mean, that's what you do. That's kind of, you're kind of finding yourself, right? But the administration plays a long game because they know you're only there for a few years. And then another group comes in and they give you the stiff arm. They'll tolerate your noise for as long as they have to, too. But athletes, because of their importance to the economics of the, the system, if they can ever harness, harness that momentum and keep it going for a long period of time, you know, recruit, recruiting class after recruiting class after recruiting class, you know, I think you can make a big difference. But that's so hard to, you know, that's so hard to do. I mean, parents have to be educated about the system. Players have to be steadfast about it when they're concerned about all these other things on campus. Right. It's really, it's really difficult. And the shame is they don't realize it until they get out of it, like, like David said. Um, you know, I remember, <clears throat> you remember, the, since you're down in North Carolina, remember the Rashad McCant story? Yeah. Remember he, he got out and all of a sudden he, he gets out and he, you know, he spills the beans on the whole North Carolina thing. But my whole thing was, well, why didn't you realize that when you were in the thick of it? Right. You know, why, why did you let yourself become complicit in your own mis- miseducation? And in the process, bring down the African-American Studies Department, you know, which people have put their careers on the line to build up at colleges and universities all across the country. But you're not thinking of that at that time. You're just thinking, oh, they just gave me a grade. I got this sham course. I'm gonna graduate. Cool. It's great. Go to league, playing for a number of years. Got my pocket straight. And then you, then you turn around. And you realize, whoa, what happened? But that was that was you getting sucked into the into the system. A friend of mine years back, he wrote a book. I forgot where he played ball at. But he wrote this book, and it's called. He wrote it for athletes, and it's called. I think it's called Your Brain Is a Muscle Too. His whole point was when he got out. He realized that he he trained his body for four years or however long he was in, but he didn't take advantage of all the opportunities to train his mind. Right. So he's trying to get brothers that are coming in to the system to kind of understand that, you know, understand that critical that critical time period, because otherwise you get used up. One of the other uh, around the horn panelists and ESPN contributors, Damani, wrote a little bit about Vanity Fair around mm-hmm. the sleight of hand that's going on too where you talk about schools are allowed, schools and coaching staffs, because the coaching staffs are oftentimes more important than the schools, are letting their players' voices be heard a little bit. But how do you balance that with what you alluded to at the beginning in terms of the SEC and that and the tape that you got? We're going to bring you back on campus. You're not going to have any representation. Trust us. We are looking out for your best interests. You know, how, so how do you balance those two things? Or is it just some intentional sleight of hand where look at these things that we're letting the athletes have a voice while over here we're saying, but we're going to shuttle you on campus very quietly so we can get the money. Going. Yeah. Yeah. So don't, you know, so don't tell me on one hand that you support Black Lives Matter. And then on the other hand, bring back your team, majority black, a community that is most affected by this pandemic than any other, and then make them go play this game in mostly empty stadiums and be on campuses, many of which are pretty empty. It just doesn't seem to match the message. Like if you really, if you really care about black lives, then it seems to me you would say, you know what, this is far too dangerous. The mission of this college doesn't say anything about playing for the national championship, producing all Americas, any of that. So just like the rest of the students on the campus that have been doing everything remote, you know what, you're a student on this campus too. And that's, that's how we're going to treat you first and foremost. Mm. So that hasn't happened. So to me, it's not, it's not congruous, right? But this is what, you know, this is what happens. And this is what happens. You know, it's all right in the NFL, they got representation. And they're pro- they are being treated like the professionals they are college athletes are not being treated like the professionals they are right and that's trouble yeah that's what i always go back to 
CP3, Andre, Michelle, they were representing the interests or the players with the right. league. Same thing goes with the NFLPA. D. Smith yeah. negotiated those things. Tony Clark did with the MLB, but you don't get that in a college sports context. There's no, no. one. Again, it's it's trust us. We right. have your best interests at heart. Right. Trust us. You get, and, and, you know, and the other part of it is, like, the, the Morris is a friend of mine, and um, and we talk about this stuff from time to time. And, you know, one, one of his big things about the NFL, and this is really true of any league if you're, if you're a, the union boss, is that it doesn't matter where you play, right? It doesn't matter if you play in Golden State or it shouldn't matter whether you play in Golden State or play in Dallas or play in Charlotte. Your work environment should be the same. It should be just as safe. And just as conducive to you having a prosperous career. It ain't the case in college. We know that. We know that. I mean, you know, out in the Pac-12, you know, how Stanford might be doing things. It's not going to be the same as Oregon State. And I don't want to throw them under the bus. I'm just saying. And then when you get outside the, 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 the power five, I mean, the difference is, you know, who knows? And then you have someone like Lincoln Riley at, Oklahoma saying that he's not going to, they're not going to make uh, uh, the COVID test results public anymore. Yo, man, this is a public health crisis. This is not a right. twisted ankle. <laughs> right. We, you know, this isn't a HIPAA situation. You know, we right. need to know, you know, for contract tracing, per, for all these, these reasons. So I hope that a FOIA request or two at some point comes in. Oh, that'd be great. There you go. That, yeah, you can work, <laughs> work that in on a piece. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's, you're only as safe as the safest member of your conference if you're doing conference-only schedules, right. which even within the power of five, not to insult, you know, well, I, I will, I'll use Rutgers instead. You know, <laughs> is, is, is Rutgers have the same standards and the same capital that they can put in to sure. protecting their players as Ohio State? Sure. You know, right. I mean, Gene Smith probably is doing as Everything best he as can. he can, but right. the, it, is that good enough? And I don't right. think I don't think the answer is yes. Right. Yeah, and here, and you know, at the University of Maryland, um, they've shut down athletic practices at least twice because of outbreaks. And then they, the reason being, they they said it wasn't because of anything on campus with the players, but it was because they went to parties and they broke the the code that everyone said they should maintain if right. um, in this pandemic. So almost kind of like blaming them for, <laughs> <laughs> for getting ill in the pandemic. Yeah. They always, being, players being always, <laughs> yeah, players are always the ones that take the blame for everything. Yep. They always get the punishment. Uh, you know, it's been a really great conversation. We appreciate your time. And it's been really, um, really nourishing. And, um, Thanks. The one thing I'll one thing I'll ask um, a little off the beaten path, but how important is music? I know you're a jazz guy. How important is music in the overall mix of this whole thing? As we look thing? at life, we look at sports. Yeah, how important is music? For me? Man, um, I don't think there's anything I miss more right now than live music. Mm. Um, music right. nourishes the soul, man. Right, right. Music is my sanctuary. <laughs> music is my life. Yeah, I, I. I, I miss it. I've been zooming in to, to virtual virtual festivals, the DC Jazz Festival going on, I think to, tonight or tomorrow night, maybe the, maybe the last night. Been checking that out. Uh, the Monterey Jazz Festival last weekend was, was mm -hmm. virtual. I missed that. Yeah, man, I love, I love music. And, and, you know, I guess maybe that, and I connect music to sports because there's a rhythm to sports. Right. You right. know, and, um, and there's a rhythm, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a rhythm to, for sports, like not just the games that we watch, but like how we participate in watching games and still playing games. I mean, I just bought a brand new pair of Trey Youngs. I still play pickup ball, but I still, I, I haven't been able to wear them, you know? Right, right, right. Um, you know, we can't play, we can't, we can't play, you know, all the gyms are closed, you can't play pickup. So um, sports brings a rhythm to your life. And right now we're out of rhythm because of pandemic. And I understand that, you know, we got sports playing right now. They shouldn't be playing right now. Um, right. We got this weird, the weird NBA bubble thing. We got major league baseball thing getting ready to kick off now. Uh, 
Apparently hockey. the Stanley Cup's happening. Stanley Cup's yeah. happening. I mean, I can't even keep <laughs> up. You know, they just had the just had the Tour de France. I'm a, I, I like I like bike racing, and that just happened. You know, normally that happens in you know in July. It just happened. I mean, I can't. So yeah, man, <laughs> this right. is part of the rhythm of life. <laughs> right, and, right, right, and it's it's totally yeah. That's not out of the realm of all of this. It's, right, it's, right. <laughs> it's just crazy. Yeah. It's just crazy. So, and my and my last question, I ask everybody this: what What's the first thing you do in the morning? Now, I know it may have changed since this pandemic and the COVID reality, but you know, I believe that um, I believe in routine, but I also believe in you know, sort of starting your day. I've learned over over my brief time here on this earth that the way you sort of start your day. I think really produces the kind of energy, whether good or bad, you're going to see throughout the rest of the day. So what is well, that's interesting. That's something you do uh, to start? I, I, um, I start every day pretty much the, the same way. I'm usually, um, I'm, I'm late to bed and early up, early up being seven o'clock. I wake up to Pacifica Radio and I listen to Pacifica mm-hmm. Radio, WPFW here in D.C. And from seven to eight, at eight o'clock, I switch over to um, NPR Morning Edition. And then, and during this time, I'm also making breakfast for me and my right. daughter. And, uh, and then after that, it just kind of depends. You know, I might, if it's a Monday or Wednesday right now with school in session, uh, I, I'm getting ready for my 10 o'clock class. If I'm writing something, I may be taking some time to sit back, look through some notes, kick around some ideas, get in touch with an editor, something like that. And if I'm going on TV, um, I'm looking through the news of the day to see what folks might be talking about. So my mornings is usually like an organizational, like from seven to ten. It's like an organizational time. That's my rhythm. Even on the weekends, right, <laughs> I still thing. do that. Right. Even though, right. yeah, even though right. I don't have to, I'm usually up at seven, man. I listen to, I, I listen to what I listen to, and you know, and I'm thumbing through the, the paper sometimes. Uh, usually, right. I don't get to the paper now until later. It used to be when I was in Dallas, so I was in Dallas for 20 years, I used to, uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, I would start out at the basketball court about 6 o'clock in the morning, mm. get that morning run in. Uh, I used to uh, do it here until my, my daughter was born, and then that put the kibosh yep. on that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so uh, but yeah, there's a, there's a rhythm. There's no, you know, my mornings are, that's a good observation. My mornings are pretty much the same. Absolutely. Good deal. This has been great, Kevin. We uh, we appreciate the time. Sincerely appreciate it. Well, thanks. So, like I said, I apologize for missing the. Uh, this is, this is just I just plugged it in wrong on here. I don't know how I did it. I should have just clicked on the the Zoom link, and I I didn't. This time I was like, boom! All right, I'm in. Hmm. All good. All it's good. Been no great. worries. And uh, like sure. we we appreciate we appreciate the time, man. I'm I'm a long time long time fan. I read your stuff, so. Oh, I appreciate it. I'm a long time fan watching you play and you know. Absolutely. You know? So uh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I like the work that you all are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Wishing you and your family all the best. Stay safe. And, Same to y'all. Uh, have a good night, Kevin. All right. Bye y'all too. Peace. And thank you for listening to Forward Thinking, presented by the PCL. Forward Thinking is hosted by Ricky Vellante and David West, produced by Ricky Vellante and Wendell Haskins, and the music's by David West. You can get more information about the PCL and Forward Thinking at thepcleague.com. You can also check us out on Twitter at the underscore PC League or Instagram at the PC League. And don't forget to like and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and the PCL YouTube channel. We hope everybody out there is staying safe. We look forward to seeing you all next week.